Welcome everyone to one more speaker series from the Institute for Ethics and Artificial Intelligence. My name is Caitlin Corgan. I'm the executive director of the IEI and very happy to be with you here today. With its speaker series, the TUM Institute for Ethics and AI invites experts from all over the world to talk about ethics and governance of AI. These events serve as, a, as an important platform for sharing new research and exchange and knowledge. Since our launch in 2019, we have already been able to run 32 speaker series events with distinguished guests from all over the world. And today is no different. Today, our topic is AI and social justice. And we have the pleasure of having Benedetta Giovanola. She holds uh, the Jean Monet Chair in Ethics for Inclusive Digital Europe and is full professor of moral ph philosophy at the University of Maserata. She is a regular visiting professor at Tufts University and is the vice president of the Italian Association of Moral Philosophy. Her research interests are business ethics, theory of justice, media ethics, and ethical questions raised by digital technologies and artificial intelligence, which we'll talk about today, especially as it refers to fairness, social justice, and inclusion. So welcome, Benedetta. Very quickly, I just wanna, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, give some event etiquette. Please keep your video and microphones off during the event so we don't disturb the presentation. We'll start with the presentation and then when we're done, we'll open up to hear your uh, comments and questions. So please uh, be brave and ask a lot of questions. You can use the chat function and send the questions directly to me and we'll try to get through as many as possible in the time we have. So with no further ado, I turn the floor over to Benedetta, welcome. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for this kind introduction. And thanks a lot for inviting me in this prestigious series of speaker. I'm very, very happy uh, to be on board and to join you uh, today um, to speak about AI ethics and social justice. So I'm going to share my screen with you. OK, that's it. So. Um, just a brief overview um, regarding my talk today. So first of all, I will introduce the topic and try to explain why it is important to, to talk about AI ethics and social justice. And then after this brief introduction, I will expand on what social justice means in the philosophical scholarship, especially in the philosophical scholarship on theories of justice, which is the domain that it, it has been and is been dealing um, more with this topic. Then I will try to provide an overview on what social justice means in AI ethics and bridging these two areas of inquiry, I will try to revise social justice in AI ethics and then try to draw some uh, conclusions. Now, first of all, um, why uh, it is important uh, um, and that's the proposal that I would like to share with you uh, to talk about uh, AI ethics and theories of justice, uh, especially considering that um, these two fields of inquiry and investigation have been and still to some extent are really to separate areas. So um, is there an opportunity or is there a need which would imply something even more demanding, of course, to bridge these areas of scholarship that, that actually are separate. Uh, and they are separate because theories of justice um, is actually an area of philosophical inquiry, mainly relating to public ethics and to some extent also political philosophy that deals uh, mainly with the ideal conditions uh, that would allow to identify a perfectly just society. Part of this inquiry also addresses and takes on non-ideal conditions, that is, raises the questions about uh, what shall we do in real world situations when we find out that the societies we are living in are not just, and then probably it will never be possible to reach such a high demanding uh, ideal uh, 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 situation of perfect justice. 
Um, and so most of the debate on theories of justice, as we will see in a while, is really aimed at identifying the main features of social justice and the principles according to which uh, we should shape our societies and also should act as individuals. On the other side, uh, AI ethics um, had started to deal with questions uh, related to, um, to social justice, even though from a specific uh, perspective that I will detail um, in a while. But for sure, what AI ethics has done so far is to highlight how pervasive AI is in our everyday life and also the kind of ethical questions and challenges it raises. Now, my proposal is to consider AI as the so-called fact of our age. Um, why am I using this expression? Because one of the main uh, import of theories of justice is to try to discuss justice, also starting from specific facts. Here we have a very famous proposal by John Rawls that in 1993, when he published Political Liberalism, he started from what he called the fact of pluralism. That this is something that truly really exists. We cannot skip, we can avoid, we cannot avoid. So we have to make sense of it and try to figure out how um, we might uh, establish just societies taking this fact of pluralism as the start. And what I'm proposing is to consider the AI transformation, the AI pervasiveness, AI systems that are really the environment we're living in as the fact of our age. So this would imply, and that's my claim, that we do not only, I mean, are able to, or not only can we, but we ought to bridge philosophical reflection about theories of justice that has to do with social justice at the philosophical level with the inquiry into AI ethics that also start from considering what is going on in the real world. So my thesis is that theories of justice can enlighten and enrich uh, the uh, discussion um, on AI ethics. And then conversely, AI ethics can help better identify and understand the circumstances of justice. That is all the different uh, background conditions uh, that make justice ever possible. So I'm claiming for the need to bridge them, not only the possibility to bridge them for the reason that I try to, um, to sketch. Now, let Let's uh, now see what this implying for our understanding of social justice. And as I was anticipating, I will first focus on the meaning of social justice in theories of justice, then in AI ethics, and then trying to merge or bridge the two, revising the concept of social justice in AI ethics. Now, um, social justice, uh, um, now, now, of course, I'm going to be quite, uh, let's say, um, sketching at the main points. It can't be exhaustive in such a short time. But let's say, if we look at the main um, discussions on um, social justice within the philosophical uh, um, realm, so in the domain of theories of justice, uh, we can distinguish um, two dimensions of social justice. On the one side, we have the distributive dimension, which has been uh, emphasized, uh, um, let's say, more or less by all scholars um, in the last uh, decades. So uh, the fact that when we talk about social justice, is, um, we refer to the way in which uh, the main uh, benefits and burdens of social corporations ought to be distributed among the members of a given society. The given society might be the nation state, it might also be the global society. And here, then the discussion would shift to global justice rather than social justice uh, per se, like in, in, in closed um, uh, um, nation states. But what is common actually is this distributive dimension of social justice, meaning who is in charge of distributing, what ought to be distributed. 
and how owed it to be distributed. And so different theories of justice, especially those that would be based on a liberal egalitarian framework, so also drawing insights from John Rawls that I already mentioned, they would claim that there should be some principles that would help us uh, identify fair conditions for distributing in a just way. Then, then there is an open question about uh, what ought to be distributed, where, whereas, let's say, rights or liberties or opportunities or capabilities, as some would argue. So that's an open discussion. But the main point is this focus on distribution. Um, the other dimension of uh, social justice that uh, um, has been gaining a growing attention, especially uh, in the last years, I would say, is the so-called social relational dimension. So uh, the acknowledgement that when we talk about social justice, uh, we do not only have to do with ways of distributing something, but we also have to do uh, with the ways in which people relate to each other, the way in which they recognize each other, or also the way in which they are treated by institutions and treated by their fellow uh, human beings. So there is a growing attention uh, within theories of justice, within this scholarship, to these social relational dimension of, uh, of justice. And this um, is kind of uh, summed up in the reference to uh, two um, uh, principles that I mentioned here, uh, treating as equals and standing as equals. So the fact that what is important to most theories of justice is to identify criterion according to which we would make sure that people are treated as equals, both by institutions and by fellow citizens. And also people stand as equals and mutually recognize each other as equals. So they do not, um, let's say, discriminate uh, anyone. They do not have prejudices and, and stuff like that. That would really hinder the achievement of a just society. Now, um, if we look at the main principles of justice that we can draw from this kind of um, inquiry uh, without, uh, let's say, um, aiming at being exhaustive also here, but I think that we can identify three main principles at least that would be very interest in in interesting when we will then shift to the application of these all to the AI ethics debate on justice. Um, so just uh, I'm just uh, um, uh, getting a little bit in depth uh, into them, um, so has to uh, proceed farther then. So a first principle is what is called fair equality of opportunity. This has been very, very influential back since uh, John Rawls's uh, theory of justice. And is really one of the main principles for us to understand what this distributive dimension means. A fair equality of opportunities means that uh, institutions hold to favor um, an equality of opportunity uh, in different domains uh, um, according to people's uh, talents and willingness to do something, uh, which is to say, for example, the access to the job market, to the economic and social benefits that would follow from them, uh, should not only be guaranteed through the legal system, mm, laws and similar instruments, let's say, but should be effectively implemented through policies that aim at empowering people and letting them, you might say, um, in, in some sense, uh, do, uh, do their best. So the fair equality of opportunity is intended as a fair way of distributing the main benefits of social cooperation in terms mainly of access to uh, something in such a way that creates the conditions that would enable people to realize themselves and to fully express their agency. So it's not just not discriminating them, but that's why I was saying empowering them, creating the background conditions that would allow them to really realize themselves and fulfill uh, their personal agency. 
Then another principle which is very interesting and I think important is the right to justification. Um, this also has to do with the power structures and relations in our societies. And the principle of the right to justification would demand that no relations should exist that cannot be adequately justified towards those who are involved in them. So this is something which is kind of in between the distributive and the social relational dimensions and has to do with the fact that every person's capability to make up their own minds, to call for justification of the present order and to provide justification, these should be safeguarded. And this is why the question of the right to justification is also a question of power because that's the question of who decides what. Um, and then, last but not least, we have the principle which I call a fair equality of relationship um, that uh, kind of expresses uh, that a deeply social relational dimension of justice. Because when we have to do with social justice, it's not just a matter of how we relate to one another as equals, like from the acknowledgement that we all as human beings are equal, just because we are human beings, let's say but it has to do also with the acknowledgement of the diversities and differences among people. And the fact that people should be guaranteed conditions to develop genuine relationships, because most of the values that people develop, also their sense for freedom, their personal agency, it depends to a great extent to their attachments and affiliations and to the relationships they have. And now one of the problems that would hinder justice, for example, is if these relationships are more and more narrow, more and more restricted, more and more polarized in such a way that would really endanger not only, let's say, justice, but also the peace of living, um, of living together. But this implies for us to take into account the different particular affiliations of people and so try to combine uh, uh, a respect for persons as equal persons and a respect for them as particular individuals. So respecting people is an underlying principles of the main theories of justice. And it does not only imply to treat as equals, stand as equal, meaning that every human being is equal because they are a human being, but also implies to take differences into account because these differences are particularly important for people's personal plans of life and also for the, let's say, the idea they have of the good and also for their sense, their sense of uh, being part of a joint project or something that might really foster social justice rather than only each and everyone's individual uh, well-being, let's say, or interests. Now, another very uh, interesting part that I would like to stress and will turn out to be very important later on um, in the debate on social justice in theories of justice is the focus on the so-called circumstances of justice. Uh, these circumstances of justice, uh, here again, if we look back at, uh, at John Rawls's first discussion on it, they are both subjective and objective. So they both regard features that pertain to every person and conditions that we might label as structural. So conditions that regard our society uh, as a whole. And especially these kind, um, of conditions, so the objective one, the objective circumstances of justice, uh, so conditions under which justice is both possible and necessary, um, they regard socioeconomic inequalities, for example, but they also regard historical injustice, uh, or the area of historically rooted injustices uh, that do not only regard the way in which people have access to some goods and services or opportunities, but also the way in which they are treated by their fellow citizens and human beings. And these uh, injustices are not formally, uh, let's say, taken on uh, or not formally addressed, uh, but they are really pervasive of our societies. Now, or think, for example, as one of the most pervasive historical forms of injustices, uh, those who are related to race justice, for example. So this inequality that is deeply embedded in the system in a structural way 
even though uh, the institutions and the legal system would be shaped in such a way not to allow it formally. So, so from the distributive point of view, actually, it would be just. But then if we look at the social dimension, it's deeply unjust and there are structural uh, social relations of power and historical injustices that shape our societies and that actually put a serious constraint, if, if not really a huge obstacle, on the achievement of justice. But then there are also other forms of circumstances of justice which are particularly important uh, uh, that are all related to the way in which we get knowledge, we develop our thoughts, our judgment, uh, um, and sometimes we experience forms of limitation on it, uh, as well as emotional influences. And this is very, very important then also in the AI ethics domain, as we will see um, in a while. So. So what we can uh, draw from this discussion on um, social justice in theories of justice uh, is also that there are some background circumstances of justice that have to do with the way in which we make sense of the world we live in. So there are some epistemic conditions, mm? the way in which we get knowledge, we develop our thoughts, both as individual and through our affiliations and attachments. And these really impact on our agency, on our capability to act, both as individuals, but also at the social and the political level, which are particularly important when you talk about social justice. Now, um, if we then turn to the other debate, so what is social justice in AI ethics? What does it uh, mean? Well, let's um, say that um, most of the times, like if we look at the main uh, understandings of social justice in the AI ethics debate, most of the time social justice um, amounts to fairness. And thus, in fact, there is a huge uh, debate, a growing one, regarding what is also referred to as algorithmic fairness. Uh, so the idea that fairness is something that has strictly to do with the algorithms that are underlying uh, uh, the majority of AI-based uh, systems. Uh, fairness, in turn, seems to be mainly understood as non-discrimination. So to be fair, for an AI system to be fair, it means for an AI system not to discriminate. And how do AI systems usually discriminate? They discriminate if they have some biases that might regard either the way in which the systems have been trained for example, including historically rooted prejudices, or it might have biases in the way in which the data which are gained are collected and the way in which people are profiled according to their belonging to some uh, groups or um, categories. But uh, regardless of uh, how it is specifically uh, they find because there are different ways of defining fairness and as non-discrimination. What is really common to all these understanding is that this non-discrimination is understood as the absence of bias, which is to say that a fair, that is non-discriminating AI system would be a bias-free system. So the point on the one side here is whether biases can ever be eradicated uh, at all, and that's an open question. But the other question is whether um, eliminating biases would amount per se to have fair AI system. And there seems to be a gap actually uh, in this um, discussion. Uh, why? Because the way in which uh, the um, non-discrimination is understood is mainly related to uh, the consideration or treatment of protected group and categories as such. Not just on the individual, let's say, but on the individual as belonging to a certain category of group. So there's also the, 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 the risk of uh, making these categories and group fixed 
rather than allowing for the change that there is uh, within, uh, within them. Uh, but there's also the risk of uh, letting uh, these um, consideration of the treatment of protected group uh, be something that not only confirms uh, data from the past, but also create proxies for, for the future. Now in this debate, uh, um, so fairness uh, is not only understood as non-discrimination per se, but is understood as non-discrimination against protected group or categories. And the emphasis is on, on the social asymmetries among group of people. So if we wanna draw some conclusions from this discussion on social justice in AI ethics, it seems that social justice in the AI ethics debate is reduced to negative fairness, what I propose to call negative fairness. And negative fairness would mean fairness as the absence of something. Here I'm recalling Isaiah Berlin, a distinction between uh, negative freedom and positive freedom, right? So the negative freedom is to be free from something, not to have some obstacles, let's say, that prevent me from doing something. Whereas positive li um, uh, freedom or positive liberty means to really be able to do something or to be someone. And I'm, I'm proposing to, to like reshape this kind of distinction, which I think would prove very effective for our uh, topic today. So it seems that the social justice understanding in AI ethics uh, um, amounts to a form of negative uh, fairness, which is in fact to say fairness as the absence of discrimination, which in turn amount to the absence of biases against protected groups or categories. And this also shows a focus on the distributive dimension of social justice in the AI ethics debate, not that much on the social one, what, why am I saying that? Because um, even though the focus is on um, social asymmetries of power, the, way, the reason why this is taken into account is that this has an impact on the way in which the access to the main goods and services is provided. So it then ultimately refers to the distributive dimension. So the way in which, for example, AI systems would be embedded, let's say, in uh, unfair um, uh, um, evaluations or biases that would discriminate some groups or categories. And by doing so, they would prevent these groups or categories from accessing some opportunities, uh, like in the job market and so on and so forth. And this is, of course, important, but is this enough? And if we then recall what we have been sort of learning from the debate on social justice in theories of justice, maybe we might come to say, well, that's good, but that's not enough. Hmm? Why? Because it seems that it is important for us in the AI ethics debate to move from a purely negative to a positive fairness. So taking into account the way in which AI systems do not only non-discriminate, but would also empower people, would guarantee the preconditions for self-realization. And this is more important if we consider how pervasive these systems are, because they really mediate, shape and reshape, not only our access to the benefits of social cooperation in distributive terms, but also our social relations and interaction. So what I propose is to take insights from the debate and theories of justice to extend from a purely negative to a positive understanding of fairness and to take on and consider not only the importance of the distributive but also of the social relational dimension of justice. So bringing in the debate in AI ethics regarding social justice, the importance of respect for persons, both as equal persons and as particular individuals. So what I propose we should try to do to revise uh, uh, social justice in AI ethics is to expand uh, these conception so as to take into account the three main principles we have been discussing in the first part of our uh, talk. That is 
the fair equality of opportunity. Huh? You might recall that was fair equality of opportunity, right to justification, and a fair equality of relationship. Now let's see what these would amount to for the AI ethics debate. First of all, you might recall that the fair equality of opportunity not only had to do with the opportunity of a fair distribution per se, uh, but it had to do with the creation of the circumstances that would enable persons to really realize themselves and empower themselves. So if we take on the principle of fair equality of opportunity uh, in our assessment of AI systems to see whether they are socially just or not, we should go beyond the removal of biases uh, and we should try to design these systems, first of all, um, so as to prov provide real chances for every person um, in such a way that would mitigate, uh, if not eradicate, uh, not only socioeconomic uh, injustices uh, that regard people's starting places in life, but also the historically rooted inequalities that still play a huge role in today's um, society. So this is something that might also have to do with thinking about the way in which some forms of uh, affirmative action, compensatory uh, tools might play a role uh, in the way in which we um, shape the AI um, systems. Now, second principle, the right to justification. Here, you might recall that the right to justification uh, uh, requires that um, uh, no, um, let's say, requires that uh, every person is given the right to provide and to demand justification for the status quo. Um, and it relates to intersubjective structures of justification, we said before. So it ultimately refers to the possibility for every person to be what is technically, philosophically uh, defined as being an equal end setter. So the fact that every person should be given uh, the possibility um, to uh, make up their own minds and set their own ends in a way which is autonomous. Autonomous does not mean that it excludes relationships with others, but it's the, the autonomy as the contrary of heteronomy. Let's say the idea that I set my end because of someone else's will. And what does this mean? Uh, this means for, for the AI systems, it means that for us, to really freely make up our own minds as individuals, as particular persons, as a particular individual, to really clarify what our ends are, we first of all might and should have a right to understand what is going on in the AI systems. And this actually refers to the ongoing debate of the transparency or explicability of the AI systems, huh? so that they are uh, shaped in a way that the people really understand what is going on. But it also has to do with the importance of designing AI systems in such a way that might mitigate or even remove the threat of manipulation. And the threat of manipulation is very pervasive uh, in the AI systems, especially in the social media relating to AI based algorithms, uh, where also the power asymmetries in terms of access to knowledge what capability uh, to elaborate on knowledge are really exploited in such a way, not only not to mitigate, but also uh, to some extent to strengthen power asymmetries. So the right to justification would also imply a mitigation of or a constraint on power asymmetries uh, in the design and in the use of these kind of system. Um, or a sort of preservation of what has been called um, um, intellectual privacy. So the fact that uh, in order for us to make up our own minds, we should also be protected from ongoing constant uh, interferences, being it in the form of nudges or whatever, that distract us uh, uh, from really focusing uh, on uh, um, um, a really free, a production of ideas. Mm? So it has to do with the way not only in which we express our ideas, but the way in which we make up 
uh, our own ideas, come up with having ideas. Uh, and if it is the outcome of manipulation or of power asymmetries, uh, can't probably be deemed as really free and can't really probably let us to set our hands in a really free and autonomous way. Then last but not least, uh, the fair equality of relationship uh, uh, that you uh, that you might recall had to do with uh, the way in which our social and interpersonal relationships are also important for us to understand what really matters for us. So the strict link between uh, values, commitments, attachments, and the kinds of relationship we have. Now, one of the main problem that we have in, in, in our societies and in which uh, the um, AI systems uh, play a fundamental role is the tendency to narrow down uh, the kind of realm of conversation partners we have. Uh, let me make this a little bit clearer. So the way in which uh, the AI systems uh, is designed, as it has been highlighted, very often might not mitigate or even strengthen the tendency to polarization, the tendency to also uh, make our initial conviction, even though they might be biased, uh, more and more confirmed and stronger and stronger by bridging us and connecting us with groups of like-minded. So in order to, and these of course might also have to do with uh, manipulation. If you, for example, think of the way in which it is exploited in the macro-targeting techniques for political purposes. But this is just an example. It's a much more pervasive uh, phenomenon. So what is really important here, if we wanna uh, um, guarantee a principle of fair equality of relationship uh, as fundamental for socially just AI systems, uh, is for individuals, for persons to have information about their profilation and categorization so that I know how I have been profiled uh, in order also to understand whether the, the, this image, let's say, is really consistent uh, with who I think I am or whether I'm not okay uh, with that. But it would also include, uh, uh, um, uh, imply the importance of including different perspectives, uh, not just narrow, like-minded perspectives, also in the designs of the system. And if we look at these from the global uh, perspective, at the global level, this would also tie in with the discussion that is going on, uh, especially in the last year, which I think to be extremely interesting, uh, which is and which I also know that uh, uh, the, the institute is very sensitive to and is playing a huge role uh, in that, uh, is uh, this importance of um, taking in the debate on AI, um, on the values that are embedded in AI, also perspective not coming only from the Western countries, huh? but also coming from the global South and other countries worldwide. Because if these are not taken into account, the kind of values uh, that are uh, taken in the systems and embedded in it uh, might run the risk of being, uh, as it has been rightly stressed, a new form of colonialism. Hmm? And that's also something which I think is extremely uh, important. Um, and so these are my um, conclusions. Uh, um, let's say that to sum up, I think we can really draw interesting insights uh, from the debate on social justice in theories of justice. Uh, so has to better understand what social justice is, what it ought to be, and therefore also what it can be. And this could be interesting and extremely important for us in the AI ethics debate. Because if we have a more complex and richer understanding of what social justice is, we might be prompted to design and develop and use more effectively just AI systems. And in this way, uh, the AI systems might uh, not only not be a weapon of mass destruction, as I, here I'm paraphrasing the famous Kathy O'Neill uh, book, 
on, on the algorithms on as weapons of mass destruction, but they could really turn into a weapon of moral construction. And it would also be of social and political and of um, civic uh, construction. So thank you very much um, for your attention. I will stop it here. Thank you so much. Uh, so much to unpack there. And I think also quite uh, positive and uplifting at the end and, and where we need to head. Um, so everyone, please use the chat function to, to, to submit some questions so we can uh, start our discussion. Um, first, I, I'll just start it off with, with one question for myself. And I was really drawn to this um, thing you said at the beginning about who the distributor is of justice, right? And we see as we moved in kind of thinking about applying this to AI governance, we see uh, recently, I know in the US, they're having big meetings about what should we do about AI governance. And when you look at who's in the meeting, not only is it visually not very diverse, but it's heavily represented by industry and like these couple big players. So what does that mean for social justice and kind of who's distributing yeah. what we think yeah. of? Yeah, so actually, also, if we look at the debate on social justice in theories of justice, uh, uh, for a long time, it has been claimed that the distributor of justice, or let's say the subject of justice, ought to be political institutions and political institutions only. But actually, if we look back even at what John Rawls was saying, uh, it's not just that. There are social organizations, there are economic organizations, civil society organization. And I think that's extremely important if we kind of shift it or transfer it to the AI ethics debate and to the issue of the like, even global governance of AI, if you want. That ought to be something that involves a multiplicity of stakeholders. So of course, uh, a political institutions like governments also would play a role, companies would play a role, but that's not diverse enough. <laughs> because first of all, uh, companies, uh, Owed not just to be some companies like the big ones because mm -hmm. worldwide there are also a lot of SMEs and if we let that be shaped just from the big companies we're going to have a higher and bigger problem also in terms of distribution of AI capabilities at the global level because for example the global south will end up not having them not being empowered and also of course, uh, a very important uh, role ought to be played by the society as a whole uh, and by supranational institutions. So I think it can really be a governance of AI if all these subjects are taken into account. Yeah. Relatedly, we have a question here about fair equality of opportunities and social inclusion. And is that where do you see the overlap between those two concepts? Yeah. Um, let's say um, fair equality of opportunity, I would say, is the principle that would allow us to foster social inclusion, too. Uh, because if you really understand fair equality of opportunity uh, deep enough, even though it is distributive, right, mm -hmm. it has a distributive dimension, it might also have a social import or a social impact, because once you provide people with fair equality of opportunity, even the different stigmatization of the discrimination that there are at the social level might be weakened a little bit. So that, that's not, let's say, enough, but that's an additional tool. But it needs to be complemented with the tools that really have to do with taking on the inequalities in the social structure. And here, cultures plays a huge role. Education plays a huge role. So it's not just a matter of distribution or something that political institutions could be, but it's something that regards society as a whole. And also I would say each and every person as an individual who, who is, let's say, called for putting forward ways of social inclusion. Interesting. Okay, uh, I see Vanessa has her hand up, so I'll unmute you, Vanessa, if you want to ask your question. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you very much. It was a very insightful um, talk and presentation. Um, you, you know, I, I sort of got some thoughts and, and, and I wanted to ask some questions about your views about this thing. So, you know, um, we all know that AI is as good as the data it is built on. Now, um, for example, let's take a company who's employing AI for job rec recruitment purposes. And, you know, um, we know that the data that um, it would, you know, um, base 
its 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 decisions on the AI's decisions on would have historical roots. Mm -hmm. Now, how would that reconcile with social justice when history has shown us that there is so much social injustice, even even in this field, in this domain of, of for example, job recruitment? Mm -hmm. And how do we sort of like mitigate those social injustices to ensure, you know, AI is as fair as possible? Um, and also bearing in mind today's context. And more importantly, I think the question, which I, I think also sort of like um, you tried to answer as well, but again, um, taking into context maybe a co company who's 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 employing um, AI, um, who will ha if the data needs to be somehow changed or maybe manipulated, then then who has control over? over the manipulation of, of this data? Who has control, finally, over which data the AI is going to be working on? Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much. That's an extremely uh, interesting and difficult question. Um, um, I think um, on the one side, um, we should not uh, allow uh, AI systems to um, take decisions on our behalf. Uh, and this has to do uh, with the need not to have fully automated decision systems, uh, AI-based decision systems, like um, in domains like the one you mentioned, like recruitment, for example. So this has to do with the whole discussion regarding the uh, human oversight or human in the loop. So ways of not fully delegating uh, who's going to get the job, for example, to an AI-based systems. Um, and that's one thing uh, that can be done at the level of, of the company, let's say, making use of these kind of systems. So trying to complement these with other ways of recruiting people that are not just based on the AI systems. But then you could raise another question, like saying, OK, even though there's human oversight, still the basis on which the human takes their decision is, even if not fully, at least partially influenced by the outcome of the AI-based recruitment system. And what if it is it is biased? Uh, as we have uh, seen, it can be, and it often is. This has to do, uh, I think to answer that, we have to go a step backwards, which is to say, uh, to focus on the design of this system. So how are the system designed? Because of course, as you readily notice, one of the problems is the data set. And that's extremely important. But I think there's not just the data, uh, which is extremely important, as you said, and I totally agree with that, but there's also the design per se. So the way in which not only the data are taken, but the, the way in which they are used to make predictions regarding the future, let's say. And so this is why it is more and more important in the design of these AI-based systems, also in the domain of recruitment, uh, not only uh, to, be, to pay attention towards the possible discriminating uh, uh, features that might have, for example, um, evaluating women as less valuable for a certain job rather than another one, or people of color as less, you know, performing for a certain job rather than other, uh, you know, people. Uh, we know this might happen, and this ought to be fixed. And I think that the ongoing discussions that there are nowadays about this algorithmic fairness might help uh, do um, do this. But there's also something more, which is not only eliminating the bias which is of course entrenched in prejudices which are historically rooted and in these informal social structures of our society. But there's also the issue of involving a more diverse bunch of people in the design of the products. So for example, if the designers are just a white man from the West, let's say, uh, Western countries. Uh, then of course, not only the data, but the way in which the system is shaped and designed would be um, like based on one single perspective. So in the teams of developers also, I think we, there should be a more diverse set of people, uh, different genders, different races, uh, uh, different geographical uh, belonging. But this would also imply, of course, to invest 
in the creation of the AI skills in the countries where there are less. Now, who is going to decide about that? This it might be a virtuous or a virtuous circle because this brings us back to the uh, question that Caitlin was raising. So the governance of the AI, how do we make all this, all this possible and not just let it be something that might come out of the out of the goodwill of someone, right? And here you have different systems, as you know, like in the in the EU, we have a system which is like kind of more uh, inclined to regulation also to anticipate this some kinds of risk. Uh, but like, for example, in the US, uh, you have a system which is much more um, working in terms of uh, like co-creation, if you want, so dialogue. Uh, rather than regulation at the beginning. And this is a, a big a big issue, whether and how it is possible to have a kind of overlapping consensus on something at the global level. Yeah, yeah really hard question. I'm going to jump back and forth between the chat and the hand. So Dodzi, wait a second. Um, we have another comment of this is extremely interesting talk. The person's research focus is on AI and health and specifically mental health in field in which vulnerable po vulnerable populations are many of the potential users in the pool. So thinking about use cases, what are your thoughts on how to integrate kind of social justice into a specific use case like mental health? Yeah, I think that's extremely interesting. So I have been working on health, on e-health. Uh, I've published some papers on uh, fairness in, in e-health. Um, uh, and I'm now working actually on the issue of mental health, especially looking at the social media. So trying to see what is the impact of the social media uh, on the mental health of uh, peoples, especially on, on, on teenagers. Uh, so I started to work on that. I don't have like specific results yet, but I think that for example, the social media um, is a great, uh, um, I'm gonna say real life case to study this kind of topic and also to have some empirical data because there are uh, some data that would show uh, not a causal effect, but a strong correlation between um, an increasing use of um, social media and um, the uh, strengthening of or creation of um, different forms of uh, um, impediment, so to say, of mental health. So the way in which the more you use the social media, and the more uh, mental health might be uh, endangered, especially in some uh, groups of people that might already be vulnerable. So that's extremely, extremely interesting. Great, something to look forward to, uh, more research coming out. I'm gonna move over to Dodzi, I'll unmute you for your question. Okay, thank you very much, Benedita. Uh, it was a good presentation. And I loved it. Now, on the issue of the social justice, like your conclusions in AI ethics reverse, I, I say it to resonate with recent movement in sustainable AI, where they are trying to look at uh, uh, the life cycle, lifespan of AI into it in terms of from designing to e-ways, ecological. So I, I, I want to know whether you could also relay the whole idea of the deficit that we have in global AI ethics has to do with also an epistemic deficit. You know, because you mentioned the idea of global, uh, global South. And I keep thinking the reason why the global AI ethics is having issues is because of this epistemic deficit. Perhaps the existing theory, uh, ethical theories informing global AI ethics are not enough. So can we take something from other ethical epistemologies, perhaps to augment the global AI ethics? I could think of one, the idea of Ubuntu yes. in the global south, where it could expand AI ethics to include social justice, not only for human flourishing, but also for non-human who are impacted because of AI. So I don't know how it to also affect your work. Yeah. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> now, thanks a lot for this um, also extremely interesting question. So thanks everyone, because these are all extremely interesting questions. And I'm sorry whether I can't go in detail into them all, but they are also very difficult and would require much more time. But having said that, uh, um, Ubuntu is for sure one of the major philosophy we might look at. And there are in fact also some, some attempts nowadays to try use that to, for example, redefine classical notions that are also uh, considered in uh, um, the AI ethics debate, like autonomy, for example, uh, trying also to expand it in a relational way and, and stuff like that. We're trying to use it to develop like more responsible AI um, systems. Uh, um, so in general, uh, if you look at the epistemology as you were defining it of the AI ethics debate, a more diversified or more diverse um, set of philosophical investigations might for sure uh, be a very, a very important. Um, at the same time, I think that another issue which is a very important is what you have been, uh, uh, the issue you have been raised. So the connection between AI and sustainability. So um, also how not only what AI can do for the sake of sustainability goals, let's say, but also whether it is sustainable in all terms, uh, then in environmental terms, in economic terms, and in social terms. Uh, and the social terms uh, would regard the social justice issue. And the, the sustainability also in environmental terms uh, would uh, regard the impact of the AI systems in the non-human world, okay? Which I think it's something extremely important to take into account. Uh, last but not least, I think that uh, these um, epistemic issues uh, should be uh, more at the center of the AI ethics debate. Because uh, I, I really had the opportunity to just briefly touch on that at the beginning of the talk, um, these epistemic preconditions of our agency. And this is true for human beings and this is true for artificial intelligence as well. So it is very, very important to stress how important the epistemic preconditions are in general. And for example, in the epistemic agency, as we might call it, that we have, AI system play a huge role because they impact, as I was trying to briefly show, in the formation of our ideas. And in the domain of theories of justice, there's a whole bunch of studies on epistemic justice and epistemic injustice that I think might be extremely fruitful also for the AI ethics debate. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time. There's one more question. So I'm sorry I'm not gonna get to everyone's questions, but I think this last question is something we haven't talked about yet in the discussion. And it's a, something I was interested in too on the topic of the manipulation you mentioned. So this person's asking on nudges and manipulation. Can you clarify how those are viewed in social justice theories? For instance, nudging citizens to be organ donors. Um, mm -hmm. Would that be considered manipulation, right? There's also kind of positive manipulation we see out there, so. Exactly. That's exactly the point. So thanks for the questions. Uh, um, what I was referring to was uh, harmful or wrongful manipulation. And then in order to define what is wrongful or what is what is wrong or what is harmful or morally problematic, ethically problematic, uh, we have to look both um, at the way in which the manipulation is uh, uh, um, pursued and uh, on the outcome of the manipulation. Now, the nudge per se cannot be considered as a bad form of manipulation. I think it, the open question is whether uh, a nudge is a way of manipulating people or a way of persuading them. And then a threshold between persuasive technologies and manipulative technologies is some, sometimes a little bit blurred. So this is something we first have to, to identify. Then I would say that we, if it turns out it's a manipulation, then it's not necessarily a wrongful one if the outcome that wants to be pursued is a good one. But then philosophically speaking, there's the other questions. Are you paternalistic if you have this goal or not? And then, for example, Stamsin and Taylor's view on, on the nudge is exactly that there should be forms of libertarian paternalism, like and the example that was brought up is exactly very much feeding uh, this uh, this debate because uh, uh, organ uh, donation is something that is 
um, it could be good for the society. So you're not imposing people to, uh, let's say, uh, donate their organs. Uh, you let them free to do that, but you consider it as a common good rather than just an individual good. And that could be a form of a libertarian paternalism. I'm very sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, as I, I said to Benedetta before we even started, I said we almost never uh, have a dull moment in these events. We always have too many questions, which is is a great sign, I think. Um, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So I would like to thank Benedetta again for accepting the IEI's invitation and to all of you for joining us and contributing to the discussion with your questions and comments. Please stay tuned for the exciting lineup to come from the IEI. We'll continue our a speaker series with um, on November 15th at 1030 in person. So if you're near Munich, please come to the Tomb Think Tank for another insightful topic. We'll be talking about generative AI, gappiness, meaningfulness, authorship, and credit blame asymmetries with Professors Van Nijholm. Um, so I hope you all join us for that. And one more round of applause for Benedetta. And I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you.